Hi. <laughs> uh, so today I'm going to do a little review for the first part of the semester. That's, I think, lecture one to, well, two to eight. Uh, there's 67 slides, so I'm going to drop like some knowledge super fast, M&M style today, because uh, we have to do basically one month in like one day. But you guys know already all this stuff, so it should be good. Um, this is the major topics. So what I'm reviewing here is just the major topics that I find that people have a harder time with. Um, and you know, a little bit of introduction first and then we'll get into it. What did I want to say also? Um, so what's going to happen is that I'm gonna send you the results for the quizzes, both of them. Um, I'll put them online. I'll also post a list of grades so that you can see what you've done up to now to see if you need to study harder or, or not. <laughs> um, what else? What else? What else? What else? And I think that's pretty much it. Last last lecture. Are you guys happy? <laughs> good. Mixed? That's good. That's good. Okay. So um, any questions for me before I uh, start wrapping? <laughs> no? They should be on. Did you you don't find them? It's the last uh, week or the week before, like lecture twenty three. You got them? Okay. So uh, where do I start? So let's start by Mendel's first law because apparently uh, that was a hard topic in the midterm. Okay. So uh, we started the semester by looking at a, we used like a top-down approach where we looked at genes as being some sort of uh, unit that we didn't really know what it is. Well, you guys did, but we acted like we didn't. <laughs> uh, and then we went down up to the molecular uh, level where we saw this stuff, okay? So Mendel postulated two laws, right? Uh, the first law being the, he was studying the uh, inheritance of genes and he postulated two laws. The first one is the equal segregation of alleles, which is divided in eight postulates, right? That genes are discrete units of um, biological inheritance. Diploid organisms always have two copies of each gene. Uh, genes can have two or more forms of, uh, have two or more variants called alleles, right? based on the now that you know the DNA sequence and the mutations that happen in there. And that alleles had a relationship between them, meaning that one is recessive and one is dominant. And this, you can see it in the heterozygote, right? We also saw that during the formation of gametes, that uh, only one member of each gene is segregated to the gamete, uh, not both. And uh, so this is the law of equal segregation, basically. And then that half of the gametes will carry one of the two pairs and then the other one will carry the other pair. And also that this segregation is random, okay? So this is kind of true, but not true anymore, right? Most of it is true, but for this one here, it's not 100% true because we looked at linked, linked inheritance um, and things like this. So this is not 100% true and that the eighth postulate is the fact that during fertilization, two gametes are united, united at random, and then they will produce the genotype of the offspring. This is something that students make a lot of mistakes in. You guys don't think in terms of gametes. You go directly to the crosses and like just you know do it from your head. So go step by step. Get first the parental. And now that we are talking about linked and unlinked, draw the cr chromosomes because one, one of the questions in the midterm, people saw two parents. One of them had homozygous dominant for one gene and heterozygous for the other one, and then the opposite for the other one. So they went directly to the offspring and put it dihybrid. Yes, that makes sense. But how are they arranged on the chromosomes? Because the way they are arranged on the chromosomes will determine the crossovers and the gametes that are, that are gonna be produced, right? So obviously it is true that it's gonna produce a dihybrid. But is it a dihybrid with both genes on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes, okay? So be careful with this. Go step by step. Don't jump directly to the answer. I've seen some people do this in the exam and uh, it makes you like lose points for 
really no reason actually it's just uh you're busy maybe in automatic mode and then you make that mistake right so um step by step you have enough time to do everything so do that we looked at the beautiful flowers here <laughs> we looked at different uh different ratios of uh genotypic and uh phenotypic inheritance right so the first one that we actually looked at is the three to one ratio that you can see here that is produced from two uh, monohybrids, right? So in this case here, we're talking about one gene, single gene inheritance that is following Mendel's first law of inheritance, okay? <laughs> now, what determines the phenotype that appears in pretty much any scenario is the relationship between dominance and recessiveness. So when you have a... Uh, a gene, there's always an allele that is stronger than the other one, that is dominant to the other one, right? So dominance changes based on uh, the gene that you're talking about. For example, if you're dealing with a haplosufficient gene, so this is a gene where you have, where only one copy of the healthy allele is sufficient to make the healthy phenotype, then the mutated allele will be recessive to the healthy one. Okay, so haplosufficient, one copy of the healthy gene is sufficient to make the healthy phenotype, right? In haploinsufficient genes, so this is a gene where you need both healthy, healthy copies to make a healthy phenotype for many reasons, including not enough amount of protein produced by only one healthy um, allele, and so you need both of them to make the good amount of protein then in that case, the mutated allele is dominant to the healthy allele. Does that make sense? Easy? Okay. A good example of haploinsufficient gene is, um, actually I'll show that a bit later with the recessive lethal and all that stuff, okay? So this is, all this is for the three to one ratio, which implies that the trait is controlled by one gene, two alleles, and then there is one dominant to the other, and it's a monohybrid cross. These numbers are important. Remember them because now you don't have time to go and do every Punnett square that there is. Now you understand how it works. Now you need to know these numbers so that you can facilitate your thinking during the exam, right? If you see three to one, don't start thinking about recessive lethal, right? <laughs> Just get to, 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 to whatever it is, okay? So, other important ratios that we learned about is the, uh, so the separation between the phenotypic and genotypic ratio. In this case, when we're talking about these, uh, this gene that produces the blue pigmentation of flowers, um, one allele is sufficient, as you can see, to produce the blue pigment. And so you'll have a three to one phenotypic ratio where you have three blue and one white flower, okay? The genotypic ratio though, um, is not three to one, it's one to two to one, and you can just do the cross to figure this out, okay? So this is a, this is a, these are ratios that are typical of a monohybrid cross. If you get a test cross, these numbers will change. Test cross is when you cross it with a homozygous recessive. In that case, uh, you have a one to one phenotypic ratio and a one to one genotypic ratio basic stuff. The reason why we use test crosses is to see what the other parent is. So if you don't know what this parent is, you cross it with a test cross, and depending on what you get here, you can see if it's homozygous, heterozygous, or whatever, okay? So that's that. Damn, going really fast, this is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one here? Um, so if you're talking about recombination and you're dealing with the parental, uh, you necessarily don't, you, you always never consider the, this guy here, the, the homozygous recessive parent, the test cross basically. Because when you're calculating the frequencies and all that, this one does not affect the frequencies because it will give only one type of gametes and no other type of gametes. And I'll show that in a bit because that's one mistake that 
the students did in the exam, okay? Any other questions? No? Good. So again, um, this is just to reiterate the fact that you have to think about gametes in all cases and see what types of gametes you'll be able to produce. Um, and then from there, do your crosses if you have to do it or not, okay? This is more relevant in the linked inheritance problems than in the unlinked, because in the linked inheritance problems, these numbers are not all equal, right? So you don't get one quarter of this guy, one quarter of this guy, etc. You will get different numbers here, and so this is why it's relevant to know the configuration of the genes on the same chromosome. So unlinked, that's okay. You can just do it in your head, it works. But linked, you have to think about the gametes and the proportions of each gamete. And, uh, and that's based on the cis or trans configuration of the genes on the chromosome, okay? One thing that we went somewhat fast on, but uh, um, I'll review it now, is the sex-linked inheritance. So there's, there are other modes of inheritance. What we talked about previous to this slide is the autosomal inheritance, right? And we looked at dominant and recessive for one gene. There's also sex-linked inheritance because most species will have um, sex chromosomes. And so in our case, we have 44 autosomes and two sex chromosomes. Um, and so uh, we, we, are, we are kind of different. Those two chromosomes, their inheritance follows a different pattern. So there's the homogametic sex, which is the female sex because it produces gametes of the same genotype. Each gamete will have an X chromosome, while males will have heterogametic, uh, heterogametes, which will produce either X uh, gametes with an X chromosome or the Y chromosome, okay? And then one other concept that is important to remember is uh, the location of genes on, the, on these two chromosomes. So the X chromosome and the Y chromosome have these regions called the pseudo-autosomal regions. So these are the same on both. So these ones, they follow autosomal inheritance. The rest are genes that are not found on the other one. So all this stuff here, not found here, and all this stuff here, not found here. And so these ones are called hemizygous genes because they're found on either of the sex chromosome, but not both, okay? So in this case, uh, it's actually a little bit simpler when you're looking at sex-linked inheritance. And a good example that is always used is the eye color of Drosophila. So when we're talking about Drosophila, uh, there's a gene, let's call it W, which is located on the X chromosome. So the W plus allele will, is dominant to the W um, allele, and that will give you red eyes, okay? So in that case, if you take a red eye female with a white eye male, this is how you're supposed to think about it, right? This is homozygous for the red, red eye gene. And then here you have the recessive allele on only one of the two chromosomes. So then you do the exact same thing for the Punnett square, which means you will put both chromosomes on each side, right? In this case here, you're supposed to have two lines, but it's pretty much the same thing. That's why it's emitted. And then you just do the cross. And based on the result, then you determine the phenotype. If there's only one allele, and that allele is the dominant one, then it will give you the phenotype of red eye. If it was the recessive one, it will give you the white eye for the male. For the female, you have to think in terms of heterozygous, homozygous, etc., right? Because in this case, you have two copies of the genes, so you have to think which one is dominant to the other, and then determine the phenotype from there. Now, if a question on the exam asks you to self the F1 generation, this is sex-linked inheritance, so you have to take one male with one female, right? Can, you know, self two female or two male, okay? So this is a mistake that uh, people did on the midterm. Um, there was that question about the bristle flies and whatever. Um, so just remember, male, female. For plants, it's a bit different. You can self them because usually they carry both sexes, but not for uh, Drosophila, humans, animals, all that. Okay. Usually when you have a X-linked disease, no, a Y, uh, so 
let's say for example the gene that you have is on the Y chromosome then all the sons will have that disease right if the father is affected then all the sons will have that disease so this the moment you see let's say for example a pedigree where there's a father that has it and all the sons below the have it obviously it's well linked okay like don't even think further than that if you see if it's X-linked, it's a bit more complicated because that depends on uh, the, the mother, right? So if the mother has both one, one copy that is healthy and the other copy that is not healthy, half the sons will have it, half the sons will not have it, okay? And then for the daughters, the daughters, it follows a um, autosomal inheritance pattern. So you have to just do the cross and see what happens. Let's take a look at, a, at this example here. So in this case, we're mating a white female with a red male. So because the female has only white alleles, then what you're going to produce is this white colored males, nothing else. And then because the male has the, uh, the red allele, he will be providing at least one of the red ones. And so half, it will be, uh, half of them will be female. Uh, half of the offsprings would be uh, red, okay? Make sense? What did I want to say here? Uh, little information for you guys for uh, future classes, but you know, because here we're teaching it in a weird way, but just follow what I told you. But actually what happens in um, reality is that usually one of the X chromosomes is inactivated for females, okay? So, because you don't want to have double the amount of genes being expressed. But for our purposes, just follow it exactly how I'm telling, okay? And then I guess this is uh, kind of clear. No? Do I need to go over this? It's good. One more, one more mode of inheritance that we learned about is organelle inheritance. In this case, it's all maternal, okay? Because uh, the egg is about one millimeter wide, and so it brings all the cytoplasm with it. Uh, while the sperm is very small, so it does not bring much um, much cytoplasm and so when the fusion happens and the zygote is produced the cytoplasm is mostly maternal and because it is mostly maternal then all the mitochondria are from the mom all the chloroplasts are from the mom etc okay and so if there is a gene as i showed you before chloroplast um, mitochondria have their own dna right and so there are a few genes that are on there so if it's if those genes are affected then the organelle itself will be affected and then it depends on the mom and so if the mom has a certain problem in terms of mutation in its mitochondrial dna then all the offsprings will have this mutation cool because there's no way that the father kind of uh, cancels that effect right um, and so this is just the example of the plant there where uh, the egg brings with it the chloroplast and then it will determine the color of the leaf for the offspring what was this what was that okay very simple example here so if you get a pedigree so to be able to determine most questions that are asked about pedigrees is what type of inheritance it is or what's the probability that the child of this one and that one will have it and so for that, you need to understand the genotypes. And to find the genotypes, depending on which situation you're in, you, you can start from the bottom or from the top, okay? For me right now, by looking at this, it seems that starting from the top is the best one because I see two that are not carrying and then they have offsprings and one of them is carrying and most of them are not carrying. And so for me, this seems to be something recessive, okay? If it was dominant, one of the parents would have it and then most offsprings would have it okay because only one allele will be giving that phenotype now if i look at this here so if we think that it's recessive then you can imagine this one as being small a small a and then this one here as being big a small a why big a small a because you need to produce this one here if it was big A, big A, then you would be producing all non-affected children. Okay. Is that simple? Yep. Yeah. Like 
when I mention it in the question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, uh, the questions will mention the 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 genotype of the people that are coming from outside. I remember that question in the tutorial. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's okay. We'll optimize for next semester. But for now, if I don't, if I mention, if there's someone coming from outside, I will mention it. Okay, this way it's simply you can't start guessing, you know, right? And uh, there's no rule really that says assume that it is like that. Usually you have to figure out what it is. Okay, there's a few examples of these in the lectures, so I'm not gonna go over them. Um, I think it's lecture four or five. So you can see the different patterns and just by looking at them, try to figure out if there's a certain pattern that you can follow uh, directly, okay? If it's full, obviously it's not recessive, right? <laughs> if it's uh, empty, it's probably recessive. And then it's just a question of, are there only female infect affected or male affected? And then figure out from there. Okay, second law. Second law is the law of independent assortment. So genes assort independently. It's almost true, but not true, because if there's linked inheritance, they do not assort independently, okay? So if it's unlinked, then yes, independent assortment. If it's linked, then depending on the distance between them, they will go together or not together. And so in this case here, we saw a nine to three to three to one ratio. When we were talking about two genes, um, that are being studied uh, studied at the same time. If you, so in the exam, there was a question about this Punnett square specifically, right? And uh, all you had to do for this question is literally do the Punnett square quickly and then remove this one here, remove this one here, and then count the rest, right? And that was that, but I don't know what people did here. They tried to count to, to separate both genes and then multiply the probabilities, that does not work <laughs> uh, because you're not taking into consideration these two guys here. Anyways, if you see this ratio here, just remember two genes, the hybrid cross, right? And then how many different genotypes are you producing here? Anybody? Four? Genotypes. 16, who said 16? Nick, that's it. There's 16 genotypes, okay? Easy. This question here. Um, so when you're working with numbers, there was a question asking you how many, <laughs> Nick, you wanna, <laughs> There's a, there was a question asking like, how many gametes will, um, you know, this genotype produce? So when you're asked about how many gametes that will be produced, so forget about that, I'm just giving the example from the exam and then I'll tell you about this. There, the possibilities are, so you had five different, uh, you have 10 genes, five of them were hetero, uh, homozygous dominant and five of them were heterozygous. So how do you determine the gametes, okay? If you have a hard time doing this with big numbers, start with just two genes and then do them on the exam, and that will give you an idea about three, four, and five. So let's assume there is one that is homozygous and one gene that is heterozygous, right? So how do you determine how many gametes you can produce? The homozygous gene can only give one allele, which is the, the same because it's homozygous, right? And then the other one can give two possible alleles. So it's one times two. So that's two different gametes. Let's say, for example, you had gene A and gene B. A is in the homozygous state, B is in the heterozygous, so you can have big A only, and then B will be big B or small b, so that's your two gametes. Now, if you were to do it for five genes, uh, 10 genes, you just multiply the possibilities. There is one possibility for the first gene, one possibility for the second one, five times, and then for the heterozygous ones, you do two times two times two times two, et cetera. If there's three alleles, can you now figure it out? <laughs> kind of, same theory. Three possibilities, right? Okay, where it gets a bit more complicated is when you're doing a cross like this. So follow here. Let's say you get something like this. Five homo uh, four homozygous genes, four homozygous genes, 
and then I ask you how many distinct genotypes will you produce from this, right? So in this case, you'll be producing 81, but how do you get to 81, this number here? Let's take only one gene. So let's take the A with the A. If you do this cross here together, how many genotypes can you produce? Three. So three genotypes for this one, right? And then for this one, three. Three and then three. So then it's just three times three times three times three, and then you keep going, okay? Or three to the power of four. Easy? In this case here, no, not in this case. Uh, well, this one is simple. Let's do this one here, okay? So if you do the cross here, homozygous uh, for A, and then heterozygous, how many genotypes can you produce here? You can only produce two, right? So then this one counts as two, and then for the next gene, it's three, etc. okay? Think, like, try to simplify these problems to one gene and then go from there, or do two genes and then go from there. It will give you an idea about 10 genes or 20 or whatever, okay? Easy? Good. You better get this question on the exam. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, yeah, anyways. So all this that we just saw here is, uh, all, all this that we just saw previous to this slide is this stuff here. So this is for the unlinked inheritance when you, where you have two genes on different chromosomes, right? In that case, when you're doing the cross, you'll end up, when you do the test cross, draw your gametes and then put them back together and then see what happens there when you're producing your myocytes. You'll see that you'll produce one quarter of each equally, okay? Where it gets complicated is when they get, where, when they are on the same chromosome. So in the exam, there was that question with the C and D, right? And so if you drew them on separate chromosomes and followed this pattern, you had a mistake. But if you put them together like this, you would see that actually big C is with small d, and that will basically lead to the genotype being asked never happening, okay? So draw them like this, then separate the gametes, put them back together, and then these are the parental, right? Make sense? And so from there, the parental are more than one quarter, and then the each, and then uh, the uh, recombinants are less than 25% each. Cool? So the question about the tester here. So usually when we talk about this kind of inheritance, we're talking about the same type of genes, right? So there's one dominant allele over the other. And so this is, not, we're, don't think about the dominance versus recessiveness. What you need to just think about is that when you're calculating the probability or for example of a crossover the tester here doesn't really matter because it's always giving the same chromosome right so what you care about is the probability of getting this one here this one here this one here and this one here not this guy this guy does not change does not affect the progeny does that make sense okay good if we don't give you in this class, but if you had different like things here, for example, big A, small B, small A, uh, yeah, exactly, small A, big B, then, then you would have to take this into account as well because now there are crossovers happening here and because the alleles are not the same on both chromosomes, then you would have to take this into account and multiply that as well, right? But in this case, we simplified it. We don't care about this parental. We just care about this parent here and what it brings to the offsprings. Cool? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. I see where the problem is. So, you see this guy here? There's equal chances of getting this parental chromosome or this parental chromosome or a crossover like this or a crossover like this, okay? Because it is found in all of them, you can technically 
erase it from here and not consider it because it's added to all of them. So it does not affect the probability. Uh, that it will not affect the probability of the genotype being produced. This one is coming, the top one is coming from this parent here, right? So it's subjected to the distance between the two genes, etc. But this one here is the same in all of them. Kind of, no? Just forget about that one and... <laughs> uh, so how do you think like this one here, um, because it's the same, it would affect it? So how do you, like your question you told me, is it for this one here? Because they're... Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll show the question at the end uh, of this thing. Okay, and I'll go back uh, over it. This here, guys. Come on, man. <laughs> Explain it like five times. Today is six. Okay. Link gene inheritance. So let's start by two genes, uh, and then we go from there. Okay. So in these questions, typically you will get. The parental that is either like this or, for example, this one homozygous dominant, this one recessive, this one recessive, this one dominant, that will produce a heterozygote here, okay? Now, in a linked gene inheritance, what happens is that the one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio that you would expect in unlinked is not happening, okay? Because two genes that are close together will go together and that are far together will go separately, okay? So you will get something weird like this. So in this case, from here, you can calculate the distance between both genes, and you do that by taking these two small numbers here, so that's for two, for two genes, right? These two small numbers here, and then you divide them, you add them, and then you divide them by the total progeny, okay? Multiply by 100, that will give you the distance between both genes, which is in mapping units, okay? So when there's linked gene inheritance, the frequency of the recombinants is much less than 50% of the progeny and the parental is more than 50%. And this just makes sense because genes that are closer uh, together will go together. And if they're far from each other, they will tend to separate. Um, and so there will be more recombinants if they're far, less recombinants if they're close. Okay, one concept that we were, yep. Yep. Exactly, this is the exact same thing. So in this case here, there's only one possible gamete that you're producing, PRVG, and then without the pluses, and so it will be the same in all of them. Exactly. Yeah, from here? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, what else did I want to say here? Let me think. Mm, I think that's it. Okay, exam error number four or five. <laughs> when you're calculating the distance between two genes and you have three of them, do not use the recombination. The recombination frequency is based on the table for the two extremes. What you do is you take the distance between the furthest gene here to the middle one and the other gene to the middle one and then you add them. Can't believe people did this mistake on the exam. Really. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you just add them. So some people, I mean, sometimes it happens, you know, with stress, I don't want to make you like, feel uh, stupid or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, talk I'm telling you, right? So <laughs> do it. <laughs> so you don't count the distance between the two furthest genes by calculating these numbers. You do it for this here, then this here, and then you add them, okay? So let's take a look at this example again. If you see a table like this, don't think, okay? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> 
these <laughs> just find the biggest numbers those are the parental okay find the two smallest those are the recombinants okay and then look at the gene that changes between the parentals and the double recombinants so for example here we have v cv plus ct plus v cv plus ct so wait yeah so ct switches okay so when you have a double double crossover only the gene in the middle will change so that's why you use these two to find the gene in the middle okay so from here we found that ct is in the middle now we need to find the distance between v and ct and cv and ct okay the way you do that let's start by v and ct okay so if you look at v and ct you will take let's take this one for example v plus ct plus right this, this parental so then you find anything that's different from this one so v ct plus v ct so that's a crossover because the ct changed in this case and then if you take a look at this one here that's a change also okay now if you look at the other parent v plus ct v plus ct plus so that's another change between those two genes that means a crossover happened so you add all these numbers 89 94 3 and 5 divide them by the total progeny and that will give you a number and multiply by 100 obviously and that will give you a number that's the recombination frequency recombinant frequency this is also the distance between both genes you do the same for the other two genes that will give you another number and then if i ask you what's the distance between uh, v and cv which are the two extreme genes what do you do you add this with this okay you don't use this one here simple because you can calculate it from here it's just i didn't want to get you mixed up with this way here because you have to add these guys two times not only one time so just forget about this measure this measure this add them that's the distance between the farthest genes v and cv okay two questions like this on the exam i swear <laughs> okay uh next thing crossovers so when we're talking about crossovers sometimes we ask students to think about how many double crossovers that you are expecting and then if there is interference between them or not so if you have the mapping distance between both all the genes then you know that these are recombination frequencies also right and so if i ask you what's the possibility of a double crossover all you have to do is multiply the distance between uh the first two genes uh, with the other two genes right so between a and b and b and c right because from these numbers you can see that b is in the middle right okay and then you multiply these frequencies together that will give you a the probability of a double crossover and so if you have a population of a thousand p of, of a thousand offspring whatever then you multiply this number by a thousand and you will see that you you are expecting 41 of them that have a double crossover okay now this uh, observed number that was from other slides because i'm just copying slides so forget about this here okay actually don't i think we're going to use it okay <laughs> i was doing this fast this morning okay so um when you have your let's say for example you're asked about interference so to calculate the interference you'll use this formula which is one minus the observed number of double crossovers over the expected double crossovers so in this case if you get a table like this you can count the number of double crossovers by counting these two and adding them together that's from the where from from where the 21 comes so you put this guy here and then for the expected we just calculated it right so that's 41 of them that are expected and then you just do the calculation it will give you 0 0.49 so one minus observed over expected and that's basically telling you there's 50 percent interference if the number is one here that means there is full interference if there is zero 
that means there's no interference. And if there's minus one, that means that one crossover is helping the other. But that's just a weird number, OK? So in the exam, read the questions <laughs> properly, OK? I don't want the same problem to happen with close to and uh, no interference and all that. And I even put a warning on the question saying read it properly, OK? So in this case, if you do the mistake of not reading and then tell me it's close to no interference, I'm not going to, you know, right? So be careful with that. And uh, you should be good. So more math. This is kind of the only introduction to statistics that you get in this course. Later on, you'll do a lot more statistics, like the t-test and uh, all that. So we've been working without really taking into consideration numbers that look very close to each other. And so if we are actually to test get something like this, then you are not sure if it fits a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio, for example, or whatever ratio that you get on the exam. And so you will need to use a uh, chi-square test to figure that out, because you want to see if this segregation is due to chance or if it's actually due to this specific pattern uh, here. In the exam, you had an example like this. It was 9 to 6 to 1. Okay, So some people thought, they just went like one to one to one, which we never learned about any ratio that's one to one to one. Only three of them. We learned about one to one to one to one, which is this one here, right? But there is no ratio that has one to one to one. That doesn't exist, OK? So if you got the ratio nine to six to one, that means you have to figure out based on that ratio, not on the this one here on the slides. If you get a nine to seven, that means you have two classes, not three, not four, because you have only nine and seven. And so when you're doing your expected values here, you have to use that ratio, right? If you get a nine to three to three to one, same theory. You have four classes, degree of freedom is three, and you have to use that ratio to determine the expected of each uh, phenotype or genotype, depending on the question. Chi-square can be used for genotype, can be used for phenotype. So keep that um, in mind, OK? So in this case, this simple example here, we're trying to see if these numbers fit this ratio here, and we're using a chi-square. This formula is on the exam, on the cheat sheet, and I'll be the others too, but I'll, uh, I'll send you that at some point. And so you will use this formula here, where you will go through this process here and nothing else. You make your hypothesis, which is usually given to you in the exam or the question, sometimes not. But because it's an exam and it's not an open-ended question, I'm giving you the hypothesis, right? In the exam, it was saying the student thinks that it might be a whatever ratio. So that's your hypothesis, right? So then from there, you will figure out your expected values. In this case, we're trying to see a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. So that means you take this population and divide it by four. And that will give you 300 for each class. That's the expected value. If you had nine to six to one, so then it's a bit different because the nine, so the total of them is 16, nine, six, one, that's 16. And so what you will do is you will do nine over 16 times this number. 6 over 16 times this number, and 1 over 16 times this number. And that will give you the expected values for those classes. Cool? When you get those expected numbers, just do the formula. Follow this, do your table like this, and then uh, basically just follow this flow here, and then get that number there. Now, when you're looking at the table, Make sure that you are looking at the right column, OK? Because some students were looking at the second side of the table, and they had the thinking, but they just went to the wrong line on the other side, OK? So avoid mistakes like this. Make sure that you're looking at the right degree of freedom compared to the right probability, which is 0 0.05. If the number is bigger than 0 0.05 crossed with the degree of freedom, then you reject. If it's below, you accept it. And so technically, when you see a high number, most of the time, it's going to be reject, OK? 
If you see a high number and you, you are thinking to accept it, but you have a high number, start doubting your, your number, OK? Redo the, 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 the question, OK? Because as I said, if it's higher than the degree of freedom, you reject it, uh, the, the number that you find in the table, then you reject it, OK? And uh, for the degrees of freedom that we are talking about, if we're talking about three phenotypes, that's three classes. In our case, for the exam, it was 9 to 6 to 1. So that's three classes. Your degree of freedom is 2. In this example here, we're talking about genotypes. Because we're talking about genotypes, then the, it's different. The, well, not different. Same thinking. You have four different classes. So minus 1, that's your degrees of freedom. Cool? Um, extreme example of this, let me think. Yeah, there's no other. Either your degree of freedom is going to be 3 or 2 or one, okay? There is nothing else. If you find a degree of freedom of six, <laughs> think about it because we never learned this in this class, okay? Yep. Yeah, same thinking, same thinking. Okay, so that's all the simple inheritance that we saw. Now the complex stuff. There's a few other modes of inheritance that happen. For example, in complete dominance, so we have complete dominance, which is the one where one allele dominates over the other one. We have also incomplete dominance. In that case, you'll have a intermediate phenotype in the heterozygote. And when you're talking about different modes of dominance, usually you're thinking about the heterozygote. So in this case, your heterozygote will be between the both homozygous individuals. So in this case, for the red pigment, you'll have the parent, this one that will be fully pink, and then this one will, will be fully white, and then in between is kind of pink, okay, light pink. And so this is what incomplete dominance is. Usually it's going to be the sort of like pigment or height or something that you can have, you know, a continuous variable, let's say, okay, like color or height or something like this. And this is usually, due to an enzyme doing half of the function that it does because you only have one healthy allele, okay? Most of the time. So when you do a cross like this, think in those terms, okay? Uh, because then the phenotypes change. You don't have a three to one ratio phenotypically. You have a one to two to one phenotypic ratio. And so that's a bit different. What else? Um, this is what I just said here take a look at this. We also have a different mode of inheritance where we looked at the blood type. In this case, we are talking about codominance because the alleles are fully expressed together. So in terms of blood type, we have the A allele, the B allele, and then the small i allele. And this one is uh, recessive to the others. And so when you have only the A allele, you'll produce the A antigen. When you have the B allele, you'll produce the B antigen on the blood cells. And if you have both of them, you'll be producing both alleles. And that will give you the AB blood type. And so if you do a cross like this, you have to think in those terms, OK? You have to remember that in the intermediate phenotype or the heterozygous, both of them are expressed and not only one, OK? What else? Question that people had some problems with on the exam, the creeper. <laughs> the creeper. So here we saw another type of allele that is called the recessive lethal alleles. And usually this recessive lethal allele affects, yep, yep. Yep, uh, wait. Copy pasted, yeah. One second, what was the mistake already here? So A, B, then A. Hey, oh, yeah, yeah, you can't, sorry. Okay, that's the mistake here. Thank you for calling that up. Okay, so just look at the email for this stuff here. Good call. <laughs> uh, what else? Yeah, I have to update my slides. Um, okay, so the recessive lethal allele. 
Usually, these recessive lethal alleles, they affect something that if, it, if too much of it is affected, it will kill the, 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 the animal or whatever individual. For example, in this case, the Manx allele affects the spinal cord, right? And so if a little bit is affected, you can still survive, but if too much is affected, you will die, okay? And so in this case, we are talking about an allele that affects two phenotypes, right? So the first phenotype that it affects, first, people calling me knowing that I'm a working man. <laughs> uh, the first phenotype that is uh, affected here in this case is the tail, okay? So if you have one of these alleles, then you lose the tail automatically. If you have two of it, you die, okay? So in terms of inheritance for the tail, it's a dominant inheritance pattern because only one allele gives you, uh, removes the tail and messes up the spinal cord, okay? For the, for the lethality of this allele, it's a recessive pattern because both messed up alleles are required for you, for the uh, cat to die. Does that make sense? Kind of? Okay. So in this case, the parental can never be the homozygous for the Manx allele because it's dead, okay? So you'll always have a heterozygous or a homozygous recessive in this case, okay? Which is the healthy one. And so in this case, when you do a cross, let's say for a monohybrid, monohybrid cross, then you'll end up producing these progenies. And so the heterozygous one Will have the uh, will not have a tail, so this is a dominant inheritance pattern. The other one here, the homozygous here, will be healthy and have the tail. And then this homozygous here for the uh, the Manx allele is the one that's gonna be dead. Okay, so in this case we have a two to one ratio. So if we ask you, for example, of the surviving progeny, which ones are healthy? Well, there's three of them left, but only one that's healthy. So that's one over three, okay? If we ask you the opposite, which ones have the, the which ones don't have tail, that's two over three. Cool. Good. So incomplete dominance, complete dominance, recessive lethal, that's all different types of inheritance that produce different phenotypic and genotypic ratios. Remember those, they're gonna help you, okay? Um, and then we have also another Possibility is the fact that you have multiple alleles per gene, okay? Because we've been seeing it in a two allele system, but if you can have three or more alleles, for example, the blood type, we have these three here. And then if you have a homozygous for the small i, then you'll, you're getting the O blood type, okay? So all these alleles can be expressed um, in the uh, heterozygote. Another ratio we looked at is the 15 to one ratio. So that's when you have duplicate genes affecting the same phenotype. In this case, we looked at this shepherd's purse. And uh, so that when you do the cross from a dihybrid, all those that have at least one of the two genes healthy will be the healthy phenotype or the wild type phenotype. So you only need, so in that case, only the double homozygous recessive will be messed up like this, and so this is why you get a 15 to one ratio. If you get a chi-square question like this, you have two classes, minus one to get your degree of freedom, and then if you're calculating the expected values, that's 15 over 16 times the number of progeny, and one over 16 times the number of progeny, okay? That's for the phenotypes. If you're getting the genotypes, which I will not give you, but you know because it's too much, you will have to do it for each one of these, and so the table will be super big. Okay, this is why we're focusing on phenotypes when we talk about two or more genes because you don't want to do a chi-square for all the different genotypes that exist and their expected values. Okay, yeah. This one here? Yeah. Uh, well, both of them are healthy, so complementation happens here and here because this one here is messed up, but because they do the same function, then this one takes, takes over, okay? In this case, we have two copies of the healthy gene. Uh, 
Ya. Well, yeah, pretty much. Well, basically here, so imagine you have, uh, let's say, for example, a gene that affects the, sh the shape, okay? In this, in, the, in this example here. So let's say, for example, you had only this. This would mess up the shape, okay? But because you have the other, they're, it's exact same copy of the gene, just a duplicate, right? So because you have one copy that is working with at least one allele, then it's good can take over, and yes, it is in terms of number of proteins, right? Um, so the only one that really doesn't work is this one here. In humans, well, actually many organisms, we have multiple copies of each gene. So usually when you get a mutation in one, it does not really affect you. Uh, you need to mutate most of them to get some sort of effect. And this is the same for pretty much anything, okay? Dominant epistasis. <laughs> this is recessive epistasis, okay? Not dominant epistasis. So <laughs> this is another <laughs> this is another ratio that we learned, the nine to three to four. And in this case, recessive. <laughs> in this case, um, in this case, one allele suppresses the effect of the other. Okay, uh, one. One gene suppresses the effect of the other gene, sorry, in the homozygous recessive state. So for example, in this case here, if you have the homozygous recessive C, then automatically you will be albino. It doesn't care about the B gene. Um, and so in this case here, you will see a nine to three to four ratio. If you see this, same thing, this is epistasis. And then you have these three classes, degree of freedom is two. And then 9 over 16 times progeny, 3 over 16 times progeny, and 4 over 16 times the progeny. Is this clear? Good. Yep. Because um, let's say, for example, this gene gives you the color, OK? Uh, allows for the color to, to, to be expressed. And then this gene gives the color. So then because we have this one here, and there's nothing inhibiting it, then you see brown. Okay? Because here, sorry? Small b, small b is brown? No. Exact. So in this case, for example, here, let's just, okay, so the allele, the b, B gives uh, yeah, but the, here the the gene is uh, is continuous. It's not like this is a kind of a mix of incomplete dominance and uh, epistasis, right? But uh, for example, in the exam the exam question that I asked, there were only two possibilities, right? And so. If you had this here, it didn't matter what you had on the other one, right? In this case, we have for the B gene, we have kind of a one, not one to two to one, but we have an incomplete dominance example where you have either black, brown, or the albino, okay? Yeah. This here? Yeah, because uh, I know because the uh, this gene here is affecting the phenotype. You understand? Oh, here. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay, let me check this out. Do the whole square there and then figure it out. Okay, because <laughs> uh, I can't do this in my head. Okay. But I, I see I see what you mean. Why why it's just recessive dominant and then you see like the white one it's Yeah. So small C. Yeah, I will uh, check this out. Okay. Where is my laser? Anyways, uh <coughs> for this here all you need to remember is that one allele hides the other. Uh, one gene hides the other. So if you have that gene in the recessive state assume it's uh, hiding this one. So this one, you don't count it anymore. You don't, you ignore it. 
We also saw another ratio, the nine to seven ratio. And this is when two genes are on, in the same pathway. So for example here, what happens if, is if you have two genes that produce two different enzymes in the same pathway. In this case, for you to get the blue colored plant or whatever, you need both reactions to happen. So if you have a mutation here, you'll end up producing white flowers, right? And if you have a mutation in the other one, you'll still produce white flower because you need to make each of the intermediates to get to the blue compound, okay? And so when you do a cross like this between two uh, parents and produce the, di the dihybrid, like here, and then you do you self it, you will end up with a nine to seven ratio. And that's just the same thinking, okay? Because um, you need both of them to be healthy to have the blue uh, color. Yeah? The nine to seven ratio? So these ratios are all about the phenotypes. So when you do your cross, you'll have these different possible genotypes, okay? And then from there, depending on the interaction between both genes, you determine the phenotype. If those two genes are on the same pathway, then you'll end up with a nine to seven ratio, which is nine flowers that are blue and seven that are uh, white. If the interaction between both genes is epistasis, then you won't have a nine to seven ratio for the phenotypes. You'll have a nine to three to one uh, to four ratio. Exactly. They're all different genes in different pathways. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. If you have two duplicate duplicate genes doing the exact same function, then you would have them 15 to 1. Okay? So g these are just different interactions between the genes. And they give different phenotypes. So, the last part. Um, try to go fast because I know the other guy is going to come. Um, so, bacteria. So, this is all for, you know, diploid organisms and all that. But we also learned about bacteria and their way of transferring genes between each other. There are three different mechanisms. Transformation, which is pickup of DNA from the medium. Transduction, which is done by a bacteriophage. And conjugation, which is two bacteria between each other. One important thing I want to mention here, because this was something that was not clear for students. So there are two types of molecules that you can, three types of molecules that you can give to the media for the bacteria. Either some essential nutrients, for example, all these. These are essential nutrients. It means that if you have this mutation here, you cannot produce arginine. You don't have the enzyme to produce the arginine. And so you need to supplement with arginine, okay? Usually these are amino acids that are essential because of these mutations. But you also have another type of molecule, which is the carbon source. And this is what gives you energy. When you see mutants like this, now you have to think, it's not I cannot produce it, it's I cannot use it. Because the LAC minus mutation is just basically your beta-galactosidase, so the LAC-Z gene not working. And so you cannot metabolize the lactose to get energy. And in this case, if I give lactose to the media, the bacteria will not grow because they cannot metabolize it. They will die. See, see the difference? Here, they cannot produce. Here, they cannot use. That's the difference. This here, rich media, LB media, whatever complex media that you get, it has everything in it. So the bacteria, without the antibiotics, so the bacteria will survive on there. Okay. If you put it on minimal media, right, um, then you'll see some of them that grow, some of them that don't. So probably these ones here are mutants and they require supplementation in these guys, okay? And so if you add arginine, you'll see that this one now lives and that's probably because it's an arg minus mutant and it needs it. That's why it does not grow here, but grows here 
and here. If you see this one here appear, that means that it needs glycine, so it's probably gly minus. Now the other scenario is for this carbon source. So if you have a media like this, and you transfer the cells to plus lactose, these ones don't survive in the middle of media plus lactose, that means these ones are lac minus. They cannot metabolize lactose. They need a different source of energy, which is glucose, glycerol, whatever, okay? Antibiotics kill bacteria. So if you have antibiotic in the media, the bacteria will die. So if you have a resistance gene for that, then you will survive. If you don't, you will die. So streptomycin, sodium azide, tetracycline, Anything that finishes in in <laughs> uh, usually is an antibiotic, so you need some sort of resistance gene to it. Also, we learned how bacteria transfer genes from one to the other. So this is just by a split up of the chromosome. The arrow, de the arrow determines the entry point. So you follow basically the arrow, right? It goes in like this. Um, and then the first gene that comes in is the purple one, which is the resistant to sodium azide. And then whatever this antibiotic is, the gene to metabolize lactose and galactose. Okay? These two, we learned them, the lac opron, the gal opron. And uh, the time at which they enter determines the distance between them. If they are further apart, they will enter later. If they are closer, they will, they will enter earlier. For example, ton and azi, they are very close to each other. Um, okay, there you go, we're almost done, not bad. <laughs> uh, so the example of the bacterial mating, uh, we had something like this on the exam. So if you have this cross here, okay, and you're trying to kill the parental and just keep the recombinants, you have to see what would kill this one and what would kill this one and keep the recombinant, right? Um, for example, if we grow these guys on this media, so minimal media plus streptomycin, leucine, histidine, glucose, but no arginine. So what are we selecting for? We're selecting for bacteria that are resistant to streptomycin, right? Because we are putting leucine and histidine while well, we're supplementing, but doesn't mean that we're selecting for bacteria that can't use them, right? And then we have glucose, the sugar source, and then no arginine. So if the bacteria has a mutation in arg, the gene arg, that means it cannot make it, it will die. So we're selecting for also this phenotype. This genotype, phenotype, whatever. Okay? And then you can apply the same thinking to all the others. If you're not adding glucose, you're adding lactose, it's a bit different. Okay? Usually everything can use lac glucose because everything that you use will be converted to glucose. So if you put lactose instead of glucose, then you have to make sure that the lac plus is there because to, me to metabolize it. If it's not there, everything will die. If you have lac minus in this case, it will die. Okay? And last but not least is this here. So there are two modes of transfer for the conjugation. Either there's an integration of the chromosome in the bacterial DNA, and then you have a double crossover on each side which will integrate, that will create an HFR strain, or the F plasmid will stay just rolling there and not integrate, okay? If this plasmid integrates and then leaves, that becomes F prime, okay? Make sense? And obviously the transfer happens between F plus and F minus trains or HFR and F minus trains. Cool? Easy? Yep. Uh, the exam? Okay. Just one second. Give me one second here. Uh, the exam, the exam. Shit. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, where's, 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 where's the midterm? So, midterm exam.
uh, which one? Uh, this one here? Okay, so in this case, we're asked a plant of genotype CCDD, CCDD, um, are crossed, so you get the F1 here. So in this case, I'm telling you they're linked, okay? So because they're linked, you have to think like this. So let's do the table. Okay, and I'll try to do it in the middle. So we have two gene. This freaking board is gonna kill me. <laughs> okay, so we had, uh, what was it already? C, C, and then small d, small d, cross with, I'll put it here because we can't see that side. Jeez. Okay, this is small c, okay. <laughs> uh, no, you know what, let's do it properly. Like this, and then, okay. So we have this like this. So when you're crossing these two, first draw it, okay? Now they are linked, they're not unlinked. So this parent looks like this, C, D, and then C, D. And then you cross it with the other parent, which looks like this. Make sense up to now? Okay, so then when you cross these, you have to think about the gametes. The only gamete that this one can produce is big C, small d, and this one can produce small c, big d, right? And then if you fuse them, can I erase this? Clear? So if you fuse these two here, what's going to happen is that you'll end up with an F1 generation that is like this, okay? This is because it's linked, right? If it was not linked, it would be something else. And so now the parental here are this and this, and this is 80%. And then the recombinants are the crossover here. So that's big C, big D, and then small c, small d. And that's 20%. So now, to find the, so we say that this one is test crossed, right? So then the other parent, the other parent is just like this. Like this, right? So this parent can only produce one type of gamete, which is small c, small d. And this one can produce all these different ones. So we are trying to find this guy here. Okay. So what are the chances that you get this? One times half of this. Simple? Yeah. Make sense? Uh, yeah. So the probability to get this genotype here um, this one here is one because there's only one possible gamete from the test tester parent times half of the recombinants because the chance of getting this one here is 10%. Okay? Good. So that's that. One last thing. Stop being lazy, guys. And uh, please go fill out this here if you can. There's a link there. Remain professional, be nice. <laughs> uh, and actually critical because this does help me because I read them actually and I incorporate this stuff, but also it will help students kind of choose this class or whatever classes in the future. Also, thank you for being my first group. And uh, some of you all will remember, others not. YouTube is gonna remember them because they were never here. If you wanna stay in touch, Here's my LinkedIn. I closed Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff because, you know, no time for that shit. So, <laughs> so add me there. Uh, and then uh, if you have any questions or whatever, let me know. Cool. Take care, guys. See you on the exam. Yeah.
the question that had the enzymes. Right?